Okay, in terms of stuff, welcome to the first February 2022 edition of epistemology. So last time we we're looking at uh, the end of part one, wrapping that up, looking at skepticism. What we'll do today is finish up part one, and then the quizzes part one cover part one, set one covers part one, and there you know, I check to make sure they're available to finish part one. But yeah, there's still plenty of availability left. Go ahead before heading on to our final bits of part one. Anything about previous stuff or stuff to be that needs more stuff? Okay, so we're looking at skepticism, and we saw that a general skeptic say you can know how much. No. Yeah, the classic skeptic is no. And there are there are varying degrees we saw that said you can know like certain things, but not know other things. But the general definition of skepticism is the denial that we can know things. And these can all be kind of summed up in the notion of the unbreakable skeptic. So as we saw, the method of the two-phase method can summed up like this. For any argument you can give for knowledge, you can give a seemingly equally good skeptical argument to destroy that. If that were true, if it is true, then no argument can, can work. Now, of course, the test for this, we defined an argument that can you know, break the skeptic. But the classic skeptics, of course, claim no, for every argument you can give that you know, you can give an equally good argument that we don't know. Now, another move we'll see throughout the course of the course is playing the infallibility card that you just know and you can't be wrong. So, how can that be beat? Well, Surprisingly easy, namely, how do we know that this source of information, knowledge, is in fact infallible? If it's somehow self-evident, you like kind of like Plato, if you just don't see the knowledge, then this seems similar to the justification problem, which is how do you know it's self-evident? And it seems the skeptic can always play that that particular card. Like, how do you know? So in recent years, by recent years, I mean like this century, because philosophy is pretty old, there have been various attempts to try to break skepticism in other ways. And we'll see some of these in the future. One approach has been on purely pragmatic grounds. Our our good dead friend, um, uh, William James, the American philosopher dead, he's famous for pragmatism. The idea essentially that the way you can say we know stuff is that it's, it's useful. It's more, it's more practical, more pragmatic to say we know things. And as we'll see in the future, he, we talked about the ethics of belief. He had this notion called the will to believe. An idea that you could somehow be justified in believing something in a way that at the same time was like totally unjustified, but you should believe so pragmatically. Um, to use one of his examples, let's see in the future. Imagine um, you're like in the uh, one of the frozen poles, Antarctica, or you know, so Antarctica, and there's the ice there, and you have to jump across a crevasse or die. Now, if you tell yourself you're not going to make it, what's probably going to happen? Yeah. You're probably not going to make it. But if you tell yourself that you believe you're going to make it, then depending on what type of movie you're in, <laughs> whether you're a main character or not, uh, you may or may not make it. And so William James said sometimes you can just you just believe on pragmatic grounds. That you should believe because if you don't, you're, you're just going to die anyways. So believe you can, you can make. It. If you believe it, you can achieve it. Now, some people take this to even greater extremes. That simply believing something strongly enough will make it, will make it true, make it, make it happen. Next, 
evolutionary theory uh, has been around since the ancient, ancient Greeks, like way back before Socrates. Then it came, uh, who's probably best known as the guy who really sold evolution? Uh, yeah, Charles Darwin. And then it's kind of like a thing, it's a pretty standard. And some philosophers still do this, but there was a phase, a fad, where people were like doing evolutionary everything. It's kind of like um, when uh, pumpkin spice becomes like a thing, although that comes back every year. But actually, it'll probably today. So it became kind of like the pumpkin spice of, of philosophy. Everyone is like putting it on everything. And so they had, um, you know, evolutionary biology. I mean, biology still does, I mean, they do it generally so because that's their field. But they tried to apply it to ethics and also epistemology. And kind of the reasoning was this. So imagine, um, you know, two species. Let's say we have two rats. And one rat, um, <laughs> You have skeptic rat, and then you have rat that has knowledge. So if skeptic rat doubts everything, what happens to skeptic rat? They probably die, I guess, because they you know they doubt stuff too much and they die. But a um, evolution selects for things that can know stuff. So if you have like rat who knows stuff, then yeah, rat who knows stuff doesn't doesn't die. Eventually, like. Evolves. And so kind of the argument was is that we evolved by natural selection. And if we didn't know stuff, we would have, you know, we would have died, we wouldn't be here. I mean, that this is, you know, oversimplifies it dramatically. People have written entire books on it. But kind of the gist is, is that you make an appeal to evolution as to how that we, we know things. The third approach is just, basically refusing to play the skeptic's game. The skeptic says, how do you know? And the reply back is, we know. And the skeptic says back, how do you know? And they say back, we do. And this becomes kind of like, who's more annoying, I suppose, type of thing. And we'll see this when we look at our good dead friend, um, Chisholm. So how, how to reply? Well, the skeptic, of course, can say that just saying we know things begs the question. A fallacy of assuming to be true is what needs to be proved. Now, of course, as we'll see, uh, Chisholm was a pretty smart guy, and so he has some pretty good arguments, you know, trying to solve that problem. But ultimately, he just kind of says, yeah, you just have to assume he knows that that's only you. Basically, it's kind of like, uh, there's a classic movie called uh, War Games. Spoiler for like a four year old movie. And the way you win nuclear war is by not playing nuclear war. And so, Chisholm, in a way, is kind of saying the way you win skepticism is you don't play with the skeptic. Once you start playing with the skeptic, you're already lost. So, what about um, evolution? Well, this seems to also run into the trap of either a circle. So if you ask, you know, why I think that evolution shows that we know stuff, then if they say evolution shows that evolution shows we know stuff, certainly. If they bring up something else, then of course, it's a new thing. It's not evolution, and that can be attacked as well. The pragmatic answer also seems to run into a similar type of thing. If you say, well, why should I believe that we know stuff on pragmatic grounds. If they don't give a reason, then no reason. And if they give a reason, other than being, if the, the reason is pragmatically, you should believe pragmatically, that runs in a circle. So the only way seems to be like, again, like the war gaming reference or the war games reference, the only way to beat the skeptics is just don't, play with the skeptic, just assume they're wrong. But then of course the skeptic can say, but how do you know I'm wrong? And so it would seem the skeptic actually is unbreakable. Unless you're just willing to say, I'm not playing the skeptical game. So in a way it's kind of like silly, but also frustrating. It's silly as we'll see, because if someone just says, how do you know, how do you know? 
it's easy to kind of dismiss that, you know, say that's ridiculous. But then if you try to disprove, you know, try to prove something, it does actually seem impossible, which shows that we don't seem to know anything. Now, this leads to the final thing. Should we value skepticism at, at all? Should we, you know, is it good or anything? So going back to our good dead friend Socrates, of course, he famously said he knew he knew nothing, which amounts to what he knew was so small that his ignorance was vast and infinite compared to it. And then, of course, we saw our, we'll, we'll, we will see our good dead friend Descartes, who claimed to be able to doubt everything except his own existence and later God and a bunch of other stuff. Now, as I mentioned before, way back and way back, skepticism was doing pretty well. It was, you know, popular. It was, it had following and so forth. And today it would be like a hot brand. But in recent times, it's fallen, you know, fallen out of favor. And usually for a while, I think it's still true today in philosophy because you always get to check. If you try to like be skeptical, people would just, you know, dismiss it as useless, kind of pragmatic argument. Like, yeah, yeah, that's nifty and all, but it's useless. Now, it can be contended that extreme skepticism is actually useful. Kind of a weird way to argue for it, but here we go. <clears throat> so as we've seen, from, this, from a rational standpoint, it's real easy to raise doubt about things. Now, of course, there's two types of doubt. There's like inky doubt, where you consider, yes, I intellectually, I, I could be wrong because there are reasons I could be mistaken. Or there's just something fundamental about the way this works that I, I could be wrong. And of course, there's like the emotional feeling of doubt, which is that feeling, oh, we all know the feeling, that feeling of not being sure. From the standpoint of like intellectual doubt, it's super easy to generate arguments for, for that. Even about things that we assume are just in a way that's like absurd. And the classic ones are, you know, the external world. On the one hand, we all believe this is all real. We, we pay our bills so we don't get like evicted. Um, we get food so we don't starve. We drink liquid so we don't you know, die of thirst. Um, we don't step out in front of buses because we assume they'll kill us. But if we try to prove that all this is real metaphysically, we, we can't. And with movies like The Matrix, et cetera, we have all have like a little bit of that. Maybe this is a dream and it's a matrix. And so it's really easy to, to, to do this. So like in the case of our senses, you know, really quickly we can bring up some depth. To steal from Descartes, if someone says, yeah, I trust my senses, seeing is believing, you can quickly point out examples of optical illusions. You know, in Florida, you know, you're driving on the hot road. It looks like there's water puddled on the road, but it's not. You put a straw in a, in a clear glass, it looks bent. No, it's not. And there are many other ways that we can be deceived by our senses. So how do we know they're working okay now, that they're not deceiving you? Now, we might assume that while our senses sometimes fail, they work most of the time. Then the question is, how do we, as the skeptics would say, how do we, how do we know that they're working just fine? At any particular moment, you, you don't. Then you can pretty quickly ask away. We'll look at the problem of other minds brought up a bit before. And again, this is the, the classic problem of. There's this kind of sci-fi, you know, fantasy type, like how would you know, like if a, an android or a robot that it had thoughts and feelings, you know, the like movie in uh, um, Ex Machina or the Blade Runner movies, or more practically, you know, how do you know what a person is thinking and feeling 
is matching what's actually coming out of your saying true things. And it's really easy to, to raise doubts about this. You know, thanks to various movies and science fiction stories, you can always easily raise that doubt. And with pretty much anyone, you can, you can say to someone, hey, has anyone ever lied to you? And people will say, yes, they have. And you may only, you might have not been able to tell about what the person was you know, saying, you only found out later. And then of course you can escalate it to a whole, um, you know, the other classic problem, down in the entire external world. This could be a dream. It could be a virtual reality. Uh, even people like Elon Musk, um, presumably after a lot of marijuana, uh, he seems to think this world is just a simulation. We're like in a computer. Uh, and he's talking about trying to escape it, uh, however that, that would work. Could he be right? Yeah, why not? Um, how do we... No, it's not true. Uh, we don't. So all that's super easy, those crazy things. So why is considering that kind of stuff um, useful? Well, one long-standing problem is, of course, the problem of unquestioned belief. Some people have no doubt about their beliefs and act on those beliefs as if they were absolutely certain. Now, in some cases, this is fine. For example, when I have my sandwich, I do not doubt the existence of my sandwich. I just simply eat my sandwich. I'm not a sandwich skeptic. Um, I'm not a skeptic of buses and step on front of etc. And those seem to be fine. However, there are others that are really hard. I mean, Clear examples would be things like racist beliefs that people are completely certain about. And this, of course, leads to horrible, horrible things, ranging from oppression to even attempts at genocide. Political and religious beliefs sometimes lead to good things, people being like generous and kind, but often lead to terrible suffering and death. And so people are often easily swayed and manipulated uh, because they're not being critical. So where is the skepticism coming? <laughs> well, <laughs> kind of weirdly, and you'll see this perhaps as ironic, uh, because our good dead friend Dave Hugh, he argued skepticism is a disease. Um, and that maybe skepticism is a cure for a worse disease, which is this. Unquestioning belief can be the disease that leads to horrible stuff. I mean, people can you know, do good stuff from unquestioning belief, but generally if there's like a good reason to do something and it's good, you'd have good reasons to do it already. So you can you kind of show it. Now, this is not like 100% true or 100% reliable, but generally, people who are able to doubt are often less inclined to do extreme and terrible things because, no, you know, there's kind of that, that shift. This is not to say it's you know, completely reliable, but it seems, seems like a reasonable thing. You know, if someone has no doubt about what they're doing, they're less likely, of course, to, to hesitate. Why? Well, when you realize you could be wrong about something, then people tend to maybe like reflect more, less inclined to do. It. And of course, this is not infallible. And sometimes, somewhat ironically, there's the effect of um, doubling down, where people, if they start doubting, they actually become more intent, sort of you know, bad kind of way, redouble their efforts and you know, steal their behavior. In other words, the doubt actually makes it worse, which is a possibility worth considering. But we could say that using an analogy of medicine, although yeah, sometimes medicine can have harmful side effects or bad, generally more positive than negative. So one of the things that skepticism does by its very nature is cause doubt. So perhaps, if someone realizes that even things that seem utterly silly to kind of doubt can be rationally doubted, you know, 
doubted, then this should apply to other things. So if I don't even know that the world exists, maybe my belief about like doing genocide could be could be wrong. I should call that into, into question. So this is, you know, people often try to sell philosophy. And this is kind of a selling point that you know, philosophy more about doubting stuff and lifting up views. And in some cases, this can be the sense of creating. Of course, there is a mind that can make people uncomfortable. And of course, uh, there is the concern that maybe you might doubt the wrong, the wrong things. So that's kind of appeal to the value of skepticism that if you kind of get the idea, well, you know, the world might not be real, so maybe I should consider these other claims you know, critical. Now, one thing, um, one thing I'll add here, which is um, in a way kind of like a result of the pandemic thing, is there is a form of skepticism that's kind of like a pseudo skepticism. It's when someone doubts, but not for good reasons, and they don't consistently apply the method of doubt. So, for example, someone may say, like, they're doing their, they've done their research on like, vaccines, and they're being skeptical about them, but they don't seem to have, like, really done their research, and they're being skeptical kind of in a, you might consider, like, kind of a bad way, where they're just doubting it on the basis of no rational basis, and they don't apply the same sort of skepticism to, to other things. So, I've seen, you know, this is probably been around. Forever, but in recent year, in recent year or so, I've seen quite a bit of not quite, a few people claiming they're just being skeptical about things, but in a way they're believing something more ridiculous and doubting things that are seen much more reasonable. And so that's a point of concern as, as well. So there is kind of that risk. It's not may get like that he may be right, that that kind of skepticism might actually be, be a disease. So that takes us then to the end of part one, looking at the basis of epistemology, looking at you know Plato who got, got really got rolling, and looking at the skeptics who are kind of the fundamental nemesis of knowledge, claiming you know, we can't know stuff. Well, we're heading to part, part two, any part one stuff that needs no stuff. Okay, so now we turn to part two, uh, the external world. So this focuses on the question, what do we really know? And what is it that we are perceiving? What is this? What is really real for real? So historically and today, there are essentially three Three main camps. And of course, there's lots of other you know, kind of fourth party camps, etc. And you can make your own. And one good thing about philosophy is uh, if you don't like what's available, you can just kind of do your own thing, make up something else. The first view is what's called direct realism, sometimes known as naive realism, sometimes known as common sense realism. And this is the view that we have before we get uh, corrupted by philosophy and science. It's the uh, wissy, what you see is what you get here. And the idea is that what we're seeing and experiencing is the, the thing. In other words, it's not representation. And this, again, is the kind of view that people have when they're kids before they're exposed to science and philosophy. So, if you ask like a kid where like the backpack is, they'll say it's there. Where is the color? They'll say it's there. And so the idea is literally you're just what you're perceiving as the object. You don't like have a you know, perception of it. There's just objects. And this is how we you know, apparently kind of think before we get corrupted by science and philosophy. So this is 
So the second view is representationalism. And this is something that's standard now in science and philosophy. Uh, and we, people get exposed to it pretty early on. So naive realism tends to go out the door pretty quickly. And it's the view that what we see is not what we get. So draw it out. I've drawn this before. Like this is a person, here's an object out there. And however the mind works, you know, it's got ideas in it. And the idea is that you have an idea that somehow all of the object out there, and you know, different depending on which you know level of science you're looking at, the, the stories vary in all their exact details, but basic ideas, you know, get. Light strikes the object, goes in the eye, triggers the optic nerve, you know, activates something in the brain, blah, blah. You get an idea of object. The idea represents what's out there. And again, this is pretty standard, you know, stuff. Have you ever had like a probably, I guess, maybe biology class that said this, or any sort of anatomy physiology class would probably cover this too. So in the case of direct realism, you just have like this. In a way, the object is the idea, the idea is the object. There's no like representation. What you see is what you get. The third option is this. In a way, it's kind of like the first one in a weird kind of way, but here's how this one works. So some philosophers, most famously um, Bishop uh, George Barclay, he's the uh, tree falls in the forest doesn't make a noise guy. He embraced what's called, well, he called it uh, idealism, but that's kind of a bad choice because idealism is often like you know, being really idealistic. It's also sometimes known as phenomenalism, not because it's like super great, but because the idea is that all there is is phenomenal. So if you're a person is a phenomenalist, phenomenologist, their model is this. They take away the object out there. Uh, most of them also take away the body. So what you're left with is, uh, okay, this varies from philosopher to philosopher, but for Berkeley, there's just minds and ideas. So for the phenomenologist, the backpack exists, just means I've got an idea of the backpack and there's no backpack out there. The backpack is in, you know, in this case, my mind, but also your mind too. And that leads to all kinds of problems of its own. Like if the backpack is just an idea in my mind, then are we seeing the same backpack? Because the answer must be no. And if we're not thinking about the backpack, we're seeing it, where is the backpack? Now let's see we talk about uh, Barclay later. Barclay solves the problem with God. So God has got like washing everything. He has all the ideas there. So when I look away from my backpack, God's still perceiving. So the backpack is still gone. We'll say more of this in the future. So those are kind of the three main views. One is what you see is what you get, direct realism, just objects. Representationalism makes it uh, more complicated because you have ideas and objects, and that makes it really easy for the skeptic. And then the phenomenologist, you just have ideas. Ideas are objects. And as I mentioned, there's like other, you know, people make up philosophies all the time. So there's other stuff too, but those are kind of the, the three biggest ones. This is kind of a dominant view, not surprising. It's pretty standard if you take anything on science or perception. Uh, that's that's what you you'll get. You won't get this or or this. <clears throat> so, common sense, and as I say, goes is not common about sense. The idea is that um, with the five senses, we're directly perceiving the world. 
And this is resting on the assumption that literally what we see is what we get. And the proof there's a physical world on this view is we're aware. How do you know there's a backpack? You see the backpack, touch the backpack. So really. And on this common sense view, here, again, this is naive or direct realism, that things we perceive are the way we perceive. You know, what, we, what we see is what we, what we get. And this common sense view, which is what we supposedly have before we get corrupted by philosophy and science, supports that naive or direct realism. And I guess I'm not a child psychologist, but apparently this is like thinking back to my own childhood centuries ago, I guess this is kind of how I thought, you know, I just didn't, I didn't doubt whether like the house existed or food or, you know, my parents or, you know, the dog, etc. <clears throat> so what, what ends up happening is this, according to our good dead friend, George Russell, he notes that what ends up happening is common sense eventually leads to science. And as everyone knows, science, of course, ruins everything. And it ends up casting doubt on common sense. Because once we start sciencing stuff, the common sense, that particular version of common sense goes out the window. So we start off maybe with naive realism, we start doing physics and science. And then that shows that this naive realism is false. So we end up, uh, he's probably stealing from Plato that if naive realism is true, then it's going to be false because naive realism gives us science and science disproves naive realism. And of course, if naive realism is false, it's false. Roughly what Bertrand, stripping away the cleverness, roughly what Russell is pointing out is that once we start doing science, once we start doing science of perception, we end up getting rid of direct realism and we embrace representational realism. And again, it's standard that it's been centuries since I took anatomy and physiology, but I vaguely recall uh, all those years ago, that's pretty much what I learned. And I've looked at like uh, more recent you know, textbooks and that's pretty much how they, they draw it too. I mean, it's got more details about the neurons and stuff, uh, but basic ideas. <clears throat> you see stuff, stuff happens in the brain, you get, you get an idea. <clears throat> so then how does science remove things? Well, according to science, and this goes back, uh, you know, we're not naming particular scientists, but this goes back to the, what's considered the, raw, the rise of modern science, uh, beginning in what's called the modern age, which I was kind of a bad choice because the modern era begins, um, you know, with the Renaissance after the Middle Ages. And then of course it ends, it ends like in 1799. And so technically you, you've probably heard people throw around the term postmodern. <laughs> And I'm used to that kind of way that's like awful or scary. But postmodern basically just means 1800 to. And we'll probably need a new, new term because it's been postmodern for quite a while. Maybe another 100 years or, or so. We'll need something, maybe post postmodern or social media age or something. So back um, in the Renaissance too, in the Middle Ages, there was all kinds of stuff happening. And one of the things that happened is the, the scientists decided that Aristotle, you know, who'd been dominating science for you know, a thousand years, decided that he was probably wrong about a lot of stuff. And with people like Galileo and, and Sir Isaac Newton and others, um, science began to take on the form we recognize today. So what did science tell us about stuff? Well, going quite a ways back to like Galileo, science starts saying, hey, what we seem to be seeing is not what's really out there. You get a disjoint between 
ideas of the world in the world. Now, once you get uh, to like Einstein and you know relativity and speed of light stuff, one interesting thing that happens is we never see the present. Whenever you look at someone, you're seeing them in the past. Why? Well, we know the light takes time to, to travel. Light has a finite speed. So right now you're, you're seeing the me of the past. I mean, it's so incredibly short, you know, it effectively makes no difference, but it is true. You are seeing the light of other, other times, uh, fractions upon fractions of seconds, but still you're seeing the past. And this really becomes obvious in the case of telescopes. When we look out into space, every light year away, we're looking back a year in time. So if we look out like 25 light years, we're seeing what it was 25 years ago, because it takes the light 25 years to, to reach us. And so the further and further we look out into space, the older and older the light is. So if we see like a supernova from 50 light years away or 100 light years away, that happened 50 or 100 years ago. It's not happening now. Another example, uh, which they figured out a uh, long ago, uh, color. Where is color? Again, when we were kids, before we get corrupted by science and philosophy, we tend to think that color is out there in the world. But according to science, color is in our in our mind. It's there is no color out there. It's simply, well, if you go by science, there are objects out there that reflect light, impacts our object, our eye, our retina, um, processed by our brain, blah, 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 and then we have an experience of color. This also applies to sounds. You know, going back to the, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Well, again, for, for Barclay, the answer is yeah, because God's there. But really, if there is no one there, would there be a sound? And the answer must be, yeah. I mean, if there is a slice of pizza in the woods and there's no one there to eat it, is there is there a flavor? So you have a piece of pizza, but no one eats. Is there a flavor? Yeah. There's sauce and, and crust, but yeah, you don't, without some, because the flavor's in your, your mind, because everyone says it's an experience, like, um, like if you brush your teeth and drink orange juice right away, it was a bad idea, but it tastes different. Yeah. Or if you uh, have a cold, you know, food tastes, tastes different. So you're eating the same thing, but the flavor is different. Yeah, so if no one eats the pizza, there is no flavor. There, there is the pizza, but there is no flavor. If the tree falls, it does vibrate the air, but the sound is you have to, you have to hear it. It's kind of like if there is a knife in the woods and no one is stabbed by it, is there any pain? And the answer is no, because the pain, the pain is not in the knife, the pain is in the in the mind. And so all of these qualities, according to the sciencey stuff, it's they're not out there. They're how, if you believe in the external world, how we react to it. So there's the world of the real, and then there's the world we experience. And science tells us, in a way it's kind of spooky, that the world that's out there is not what we actually experience, that behind it, is something totally different. And there is some interesting uh, horror stories. Uh, this uh, author, oh, running you know, quite a while ago, back in the 20s, early 1900s, uh, Arthur Machen wrote a story called The Great God Pan. He was a huge influence on H.P. Lovecraft. He's a completely racist guy. And in The Great God Pan, the idea was that if you could ever see true reality, it would drive you like mad, drive you insane. And one thing common in the nature of Lovecraft, a lot of the stories were a similar thing. If you could if you could catch a glimpse of the real reality, the nightmare reality, you would go, go insane. Hopefully it doesn't work that way. But uh, 
Thanks for and he was uh, Lovecraft was influenced quite a bit uh, by uh, like Einstein's ideas and this idea of like other dimensions, etc. And that knowledge could could drive one mad, which of course it totally did. And so this seems to be like what science says. So we end up, according to Russell, at least, science ends up getting us to representational realism. There's a world for real out there, but what we experience is different from that world. So there's the ideas we have of things. Now, the representational realists who aren't skeptics, they, if you ask them, is there stuff out there? They say, yeah, totally. What's it like? Uh, most of it's not like what we think it is. But is there stuff out there? Yeah, yeah, sure. So who are some famous representational realists? Well, probably one of the best known is our good dead friend, John Locke. He's known um, quite a bit for his political philosophy. He's the life, liberty, property guy. Uh, not pursuit of happiness, but actually property. And he helped develop um, uh, what's called natural rights theory, the right to life, life. And as you might imagine, uh, it was influence on the Declaration of Independence and American political philosophy. Also, he did uh, epistemology and metaphysics. Born in 1632, died 1704, still very dead today. So in terms of where Locke belongs, he's an empiricist. As I mentioned, generally, if you're like, not sure if someone's a rationalist or empiricist. Generally, if they have like a French or German sounding name, which is not always you know, completely reliable, but then like uh, they're probably a rationalist, at least during this time period. So like Descartes, uh, Leibniz, rationalist. If they have like an English e English sounding, or I don't want to say English, uh, King United Kingdom e sounding name, uh, like Locke or Berkeley or Hume, then probably empiricist. Not sure what. Maybe it's like the food or the weather or something, but this is how, how it worked. And yeah, I'm actually a rationalist too. You know, last year, not French, so gotta, gotta be a rationalist. I think it's just required. <laughs> it's just required. Uh, maybe, maybe it is. So, Locke, what does he end up doing? Well, one of the things we'll see when we have more and more detail when we talk about him is with one exception, God, and God is always like kind of like a special exception. He, when it comes to the notion of innate knowledge, innate ideas, he says, nope, we haven't got that, except God, one exception. And so being an empiricist, he believes it all comes from experience. Again, that's kind of our big divide, the empiricist to say, whatever you know, what's out there comes in through the senses. The rationalists say, at least of some of them, at least one thing maybe that you can know about what's out there, you can do through pure reason. And usually for many rationalists, that one thing is often like God. So in addition to being an empiricist, Locke also holds to basically following the, the scientist of, of his time to a theory of perception that's based on causation. Now, obviously, he didn't know about like all the you know, neuro science of today, but the basic idea is from then is the same as it is now. You get light hit, you know, it's an object, bounces off, hits the eye, it does something to the brain, you get you get an idea. And then there's a, a branch of philosophy called philosophy of mind, which deals with the question of like, what is that? What is the mind? In a way, it kind of sells self-identifying uh, as to what it's about. And there's different different views there. Like there's a view that the brain is the mind. You are your, your brain. And that's called identity, identity theory. There's also the view that you are your soul and you have a body, including the brain. That's typically called dualism. Then there's a view that you are just a soul. Uh, there is no brain or body, and that's, again, phenomenal. That phenomenal is, is just all ideas. 
in kind of another another triple well, this is kind of a triple division in philosophy. There are people who say it's all just body. They're philosophical materials. There are those who say it's body and mind, philosophical dualist, and there are those who say it's just mind. They're known as phenomenologists. Locke was a dual, dualist empiricist. Not like dualist, like you know, pistols or swords at dawn, but he seemed to have believed in, a, in an immaterial soul, but also a physical, physical body. <clears throat> So this is kind of the, the map of how it works. So for Locke, and this pretty much applies today, like if you took a class on perception today in the sciences, I mean, we would have obviously like more neuroscience, et cetera, but essentially you would work in the same kind of way. So you get stuff out in the world, and we'll see when Locke talks about skepticism, he basically says, yeah, maybe you can't be sure, but this is basically who cares. So then you get uh, energy. And again, Locke was, you know, he wasn't aware of like photons and so forth, but today we get like photons, et cetera. And something hits our sense organs, either like, you know, photon, photon sending us or sound waves or whatever, chemical energy. Then goes to the brain, you get a brain event, and then you get a mental event. Now, depending on your philosophy of mind, there's all kinds of disagreement about like what this is. You know, is there a soul involved uh, or what? So then you get the perceptual experience, which creates what's called, what philosophers called a percept, which is you know, perception chopped down. Sometimes referred to as a sense datum, like a bit of sensory data, or kind of more informally, a sense impression. And that's kind of the map you would, to even, even today you, you would get like, of course with more, more like sciencey stuff for like a science class. And this has been pretty much the dominant model more or less for uh, centuries now. So maybe, maybe right. <laughs> but then again, Aristotle dominated science for, you know, a thousand years and definitely not, not right. <laughs> so representation rules on this Kind of pretty standard again. It's kind of as far as I know, it's the default of science today, and still you know pretty much stock in philosophy. So the model essentially is this: you've got an external world, and we experience it, and we create ideas. Now, as I mentioned earlier, back in part one, which ended just a few minutes ago, this uh, fellow Galileo Galilei. Uh, telescope guy developed this distinction between primary qualities and secondary qualities. And here's the distinction. And this ties into representational realism in the following way. So primary qualities, you can think of these as you know, qualities being out there in the world. So they're part of their objects, and if you have an idea of a primary quality, you have an idea of the real, the real thing. Common examples of these would be like being solid, three-dimensional, extension, which is basically three-dimensionality as well. A uh, figure would be like, you know, geometric figure like shape, etc. Movement, rest, number, and things we think of like the scientific qualities, mass, volume, density. Uh, chemical composition would be in there as well. And for people who hold to this view, these things would be what's really real for real out there. They're what's out there. And these are the building blocks of knowledge because they're really what's out there. So mass, density, volume, shape are out there in the world. 
and along this view, no. Now, the secondary qualities are not out there. Where are they? Well, they're caused by the primary qualities, assuming there's stuff out there, but they exist in our, our mind. A good example of this is, uh, well, the usual suspects are color, sound, smells, taste, touch, and other sensations. And kind of a good example of this is uh, taste. There's a, I think it still exists. Uh, last year when I checked, it was still around. A uh, cereal called Kicks. And back when I was in grad school, their little advertising slogan was, the taste is in the shape, which of course, by coincidence, I and uh, my roommate were taking a class um, on this time period of philosophy, learning about primary and secondary qualities. So we found it hilarious because our brains were damaged from, from grad school. But actually, it is right. The taste is, in fact, in the shape, and they're expressing you know, a, a primary secondary quality distinction. And I kind of wondered if the person writing that had, you know, had, had taken philosophy classes. So science tells us that the actual flavor of something is not in the thing. The taste is in the shape in the sense that it's how our tongue reacts to it. So there is the objective qualities of say sugar or pizza pizza, and that would be its molecular composition. You know, draw some. Some molecules. But I'm totally making this up. I'm just sticking on some oxygens and hydrogens. And <laughs> it's probably something, probably poisonous, <laughs> would be my guess. And so you can do a chemical analysis of something, but could you analyze something and find its taste? No, I mean, you, you can make like, you could kind of guesstimate, like if something is like chemically a sugar, you could say, well, based on my past experience with sugar, it probably tastes like this, but there's no taste in there. There's just molecules and their arrangement. But if, you, if someone eats it, they will have a response. And of course, things taste different to different people at, and also the same person at different, different times. Like for example, um, no, when, generally when you're eating food, one thing that happens is you're, if you're eating the same thing like over and over, like hot sauce or something, eventually it stops getting as, as hot. The flavor starts to kind of fade or stops tasting as good. Think of like, like when you're eating, say, cake, or, you know, you're eating cake, first one is it's pretty good. But if someone keeps shoving cake into their cake port, eventually the, the taste starts to, to change their response too, even though it's chemically the same cake. So yeah, the taste is in the shape of molecules. And so it's a response of our tongue, the molecules of our tongue, you know, basically doing a chemical analysis and then sending a signal to our brain, which creates that sensation or sweetness or you know, yummy pleasure or whatever we're, we're experiencing. Uh, color is also a good example. Color is not out there in the world. Uh, color is just in our, our mind. It's to use kind of a metaphor. It's kind of like um, our mind. Have you ever used like something like uh, Photoshop or, you know, you could have like a line drawing of something and then you can use the paint bucket and just, you know, put some paint in there. So we could say, if you want to do a primary secondary quality kind of metaphor, you could say the, um, the black and white line drawing is what's really out there, like the object. And then when you get in your, your brain, your brain like paints it, you know, throw some, you know, some color on it and that based on how your, your brain works. And so what you have in there is the color is not out there, the shape is, but you just kind of put the color on it in your, in your mind. And we know this to be true because some people are colorblind and people perceive color differently. Let me mention my own case, my, I don't know if this is, I guess, maybe, I'm sure this affects other people too, but I actually see color differently depending on which I'm using. So not like a huge difference, it's not like, you know, the backpack is purple to my, my right eye and, you know, you're gray to the left eye, but it does, the color does shift. And I, I don't think that I'm, 
you know, peering into different realities. It's just my, you know, my, the way my eye is configured, it sees the color of slightly different colors in my. So we end up with this you know, primary, secondary qualities, representational realism. So, continuing with our good dead friend Walt, and this is all uh, heading towards the problem of the external world. So, you may be wondering, like, where is this going? Uh, it's talking, you're talking about serials and so forth. And this is going somewhere. So Locke. So Locke embraces the primary secondary quality distinction, but he ends up, uh, you know, doing slight modifications. Nothing extreme. He's basically keeping to the, the basics. So for him, the secondary qualities are powers that produce sensations or perceptions in us, and the primary qualities cause the secondary qualities that we we perceive. So primary qualities are what's real, and then they affect us in ways that we, our minds, in a way, give our perception the secondary qualities. So all the secondary qualities are in our minds. Colors in the mind, taste is in the mind, uh, smell is in, in the mind. So again, going back to the question of tree falls in the wood, and just no, no one up here doesn't make a sound, Locke would say it does not make a sound because sound is your experience of the motion of molecules hitting your eardrum, heading down your nerve, getting to your brain, then doing a, you know, some sort of ghost magic um, in there or with the soul of this as well. Now, this also takes us into some metaphysics. So the question is. In the secondary are here, what's out there? And is it something like terrifying and bad? Well, here's what he finds. One of the many fights in metaphysics is the fight over substance. Also, substrata, because philosophers use the terms interchangeably, even though they're technically kind of different. So what's this fight? Well, here's the um, this use of substance, also substrate. So one thing that philosophers uh, noticed is this: qualities, properties, you don't find kind of like hanging out of the room. So, for example, do you ever encounter just like green, not a green thing, just like green itself. I mean, what, what would that even be like? You know, yeah, you encounter green markers, but I can't like pull out the green and have a handful of green. I, I could get green ink all over myself, sure, but I can't have just like green. Similarly, although we do see things with shapes, we just don't see, we don't simply see this like shape on its own without any other qualities. And similarly, we don't find this mass hanging out by itself. You couldn't buy I suppose you wanted to like um, you know anchor your boat, you wouldn't you would go and buy an anchor, you wouldn't buy like a bunch of like mass and add mass to like a bag and you know throw that out because that is your anchor. I mean kind of funny, but impossible. Yeah, so all these qualities you think of is things that can't exist on their own. Like you can't find just like blue hanging up by itself or you know density hanging up by itself. You always encounter objects with color, shapes, density, masses, and volumes. And people said, wow, that's kind of interesting. I wonder, wonder why that's the case. So they developed this notion of substance. And a substance is a thing that can exist on its own, uh, broadly speaking. So for example, this marker, you can imagine like uh, this marker like floating in space all by itself. But you couldn't imagine just like, you can imagine a green thing, but you couldn't imagine like green or mass just by itself. It's going to be something that is green, something that has mass. So they also kind of pushed this and said, well, 
what is it that makes this thing into like a distinct thing? And they still get using the word substance, although more careful people use substrate. So in this role, the role of substrata is this. Everyone familiar with uh, the potato head toys? Yeah, what are those? So, yeah, you got a you got a plastic potato. And what do you do? With it? Yeah, what's inside? Plastic. Yeah, plastic. Yeah, little parts and put the parts on the the potato head. So metaphorically speaking. You can think of the little plastic like eyes and ears and lips and stuff. Think of those as like the qualities, like the green, the shape, the density of the bats. And then you stick them onto the potato head to like, you know, make the potato head person, the Mr. or Mrs. So metaphorically, you can think of the substrate as a similar thing. The idea is, is that you have this substrate, and then properties kind of like stick into it, like green you know, having this cylinder shape, a certain mass, density, volume, and it's kind of what all the properties are like stuck to, forming like a whole thing. And again, kind of like, you know, Mr. Potato Head, where you've got like the potato thing, you have like the eyes stuck on the nose, the mouth, the ears, the teeth, and of course the hat. So, you can kind of think of metaphorical like that. The substrata is like what all those things are stuck into. So log, you know, buys into this model. There are qualities, and the qualities like are stuck into the substrata substance, and they form objects, they form things. So under the ideas, there is like reality. So on Locke's view, there's stuff out there that we have ideas of, and there's a substrata for each thing is like a substrata, and there are the primary qualities like stuck into it. And we get ideas of this, but we also, of course, get ideas caused by the primary qualities that give us the secondary qualities. So all weird and complicated. <clears throat> So what is what is this this substrate this this thing into which all the properties are stuck? Well, Locke and others, the empiricist, said, well, it can't be a property itself because it's what's supposed to the property that's supposed to stick into. I mean, to use the silly analogy of Mr. Potato Head, you can stick the pieces into the potato head, but you can't like stick the potato head to the at least as as soul. So the substrata can have properties, but properties don't mean that a substrata can have like a substrata. Now his response, and we'll see this in the future, he says, basically a mystery, something I know not what. Why? Well, you end up with this kind of like serious problem, which is. Although you never find properties just on their own, you don't find like green just hanging out by itself. If you take away all the properties of something, let's take a, this example. Suppose we took away the green, the shape, the volume, the mass, the density, all the properties of this marker. What would we be left with? What would be resting in my hand? I took away every single property. Oh, even those, take those away. Yeah, the answer would seem to be, I get a whole bunch of nothing. But on the substrata view, there would still somehow be a, what's called a bare particular. <laughs> there would still be, like going with Mr. Potato Head analogy, there would still be the potato sitting there. But you wouldn't mean, the analogy breaks down because you can see the potato, et cetera, but you know, there would be what everything was stuck into, it would still be there, Although it would have no qualities. You couldn't see it, you couldn't feel it, you couldn't hear it, you couldn't touch it. It would, it would seem to be just, yeah, you said, nothing. And so one of the standard arguments against this stuff is, is that you take away all the qualities, what's left? And the answer would seem to be nothing. 
but then we have good reasons to think it exists, but it would seem to be like nothing. And that's kind of a problem, you know, because it can have qualities of its own. It would seem to be nothing, but it's got to be something. So what is it? What is why Locke physically says this? You gotta, he thinks you gotta have it, but you don't know what it is. So it's something I don't know what. And he's pretty reluctant about it. He's like, yeah, this is all this is terrible. I don't, I don't want to have this. But he kind of accepts it because he can't think of anything. Yeah. Now we turn to Barclay, George Barclay. A bit about him. So Barclay comes after Locke. You know, Locke basically does the substance thing. He says, yeah, you gotta accept the substance, this matter out there. But even he is pretty reluctant about it. It's like, yeah, this is a terrible idea. Why are we even doing this? Oh yeah, we haven't got anything done. And Barclay comes along and says, hold my tar water. Uh, I've got a better idea. So what Barclay does is this. He essentially, in a weird way, solves the problem in the external world by just saying that's that's how it works. Because as we saw, you know, the kind of the stock problem in the external world is how do you know what you're experiencing is really real? How do you know this stuff out there? And Barclay says, there's nothing out there. There's no cave, there's no matter out there. There is no physical world. There is just ideas, which is kind of, in a way, kind of, I guess, would short circuit or damage the brain of the skeptic. As you can imagine, like Barclay the skeptic talking, and the skeptic's like, How do you know there's anything out there? And Barclay says, There's nothing out there. And the skeptic's like, Wait, what? Yeah, no, there's nothing out there, man. Um, the skeptic's like, Hey, that's it's gotta be still out there. Like, Who's a skeptic now? So he embraces um, phenomenology. Why? Well, it's kind of a it's like a gateway drug path that you know because there's the the claim uh, in some things that a person starts with like I don't know like a Red Bull eventually leads to crystal meth or something, but it's kind of like the gateway theory. So if, you, if a person starts out with direct realism, then they do some science. They're like, hey, direct realism is not true. It must be a representation. There must be you know, objects out there that we have ideas of, but our ideas are not exactly like the objects. You know, so color and taste and all this stuff is in our mind. So there's our idea and the objects are separate. And that, of course, is a gateway <laughs> drug to phenomenology, because then it would seem the next reasonable step is to say, well, why do you even need this? Why do you need this? You can just have, have this. You just have the mind and you have ideas. Done and done. And Barclay, that's what he does. He, uh, 1685 to 1753, uh, dead, um, not dead. Well, yeah, then he's a this is so far, he's kind of an interesting character because uh, he was very uh, famous university, uh, Berkeley, Berkeley, which is pronounced differently, is named after him. The apparently the founder of that town was a big fan of for real of George, George Barkley. You can confirm all of this on Wikipedia because if you can't trust Wikipedia, what can you trust? And he also, uh, Donated money to what later became like Harvard and Columbia, uh, donated books, etc. Um, he was really into tar water, which is exactly what it sounds like tar and water, and he believed it could cure stuff. Uh, we can't, tar is poisonous, so, <laughs> so that, was, that was bad. But all philosophers eventually go crazy, and as a philosopher, you get to pick like your crazy thing. So, what he ended up, ended up embracing before the tar water was what he called immaterialism also known as phenomenology. So what he does, one thing that often happens in philosophy is you 
you have someone who could do some stuff and well known to philosophy, and then someone will come along and say, yeah, that was a pretty good start, but let's, you know, we gotta, we gotta make this better. And the British and empiricist, the you know, the United Kingdom empiricist, you know, Locke comes along, gets super famous. Then David Hume comes along, criticizes Locke, and Barclay also comes along and criticizes Locke. And kind of the battle of the empiricist, it's kind of like you see in, in politics or religion, where someone will come along and say, hey, they didn't get it quite right. You know, they agree with the basics, but they make like a new version. Kind of like with Christianity, you have like original Christianity, but then you get all these variations. You know, people come up with new, new churches, new religions. So Berkeley looks at Locke and says, good start, good effort, but no. So what he wanted to do was essentially get rid of the primary secondary distinction. He thought it was unsound. Why? Well, he argues at great length that the so-called primary qualities are no more out there than the secondary qualities. And it's kind of a clever argument because, you know, again, going back to my guide cartoon, So with representational realism, the claim is somehow under, hidden under the, our experience are these, the real, there's the, the real primary qualities. And then we have an experience of the secondary qualities. And Barclay says, well, essentially he's just stealing from the skeptics. We never really experienced this, we just experienced this. And so the primary qualities are not out there, they're in here too. In a way, he's kind of saying that they're all in a way secondary qualities because they're all in our mind. But he's also saying there are no, there really are no primary qualities because there's nothing, there's no physical stuff out there. He also argues a great length that our perceptions can't be like the physical objects that are supposed to be out there. That ideas can only be like ideas, they can't be like objects or silly claims. Also, also, as I mentioned, Locke was really like a reluctant acceptor of substance. He was kind of like, ah, this is the only thing, you know, this is all we got. It's garbage, but we haven't got anything, anything bad. And Barclay says, ah, I do, I have something. Let's get rid of that garbage. So Locke was really reluctant in accepting. He thought you got to accept it because you just you need it, but it's terrible. And Barclay says, why accept it? Just, just get rid of it. Don't, don't have that. And he, you know, referencing Locke himself, what's the difference between something you don't know what? And nothing at all. And he says essentially you know, nothing. So he rejects the whole notion of physical substance. Also, also one, one kind of uh, big irony of the representation of realism is that it ends up uh, it ends up just being allowing for skepticism. Specifically, of course, at a close. Once you say there's something out there and you have this idea of it, but it's not the thing, well, this is the old skeptical problem. How do you know there's anything out there? And again, Barclay, in a weird way, beats a skeptic because what the skeptic says is maybe this is all, all there is. There's nothing out there. And Barclay says, you're right. There is nothing out there. This is all there is. And the skeptic is like, wait, well, what? And Barclay's like, yeah, skeptic beat me. Skeptical skepticism only works when you say there's something out there, um, but you don't know it's out there. And Barclay says there's nothing out there. Problem solved. Okay, so next time, um, more stuff. So have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you in the future.